Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot, known locally as a February room, is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite developments, fly rods, and fishing accessories. Tech, precision, ingenuity, legacy. Go to cdfishing.us and follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Here's your host, Lauren Carnoff, and this is The February Room. Welcome to another episode of The February Room. Today, my guest is a guide, fly tire, teacher, musician, co-founder of California <laughs> Bass Union, an ambassador, and we could probably go on, but it's Hogan Brown. Thank you so much for joining me today, Hogan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I was excited. I, I, I was excited to be on. I am so excited to have you on because it has been forever since we've seen each other. I think it's been four. Has it been 12, 12 years and you were doing a fly tying for um, fly fishing the world segment? And um, yeah. I remember I was I was I was the one behind the scenes editing that fly tying video. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's funny. It, it Time goes by it as I've gotten older. Time goes by at a much different rate. So, I mean, if it was five years ago, it could have been five years, but it, it was probably a lot longer than that. So it really uh, was that long ago. I mean, thanks to you, yeah. I get to stay flashaboo with confidence. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but totally. anyway, as we said, you have an amazing background with fly tying, fly fishing, and being an ambassador. And I know that you have a story that you could share with us today, and I'd love to hear it. Sure. Yeah. You know, I was. It was funny. I. I. Uh, you asked me a story, and you know, one thing I thought of two things. One. Uh, one is a guide you know, you get to hear everyone else's best stories. Your clients are always kind of in the boat and they want to tell you your best stories. So most of my like fishing stories, it's funny. I'm such like a, I'm not, you know, I listened to Justin's episode with Frank Smethurst the other day and I've known both those guys for a long time. And like Smethurst story was like near death experience on this like yes. pioneering trip and i'm like dude i got nothing like that man i'm like <laughs> i go fishing I'm... with my kids like 20 minutes from my house man or maybe you're just making sure that there's there's some oars on the boat <laughs> yeah i'm like oh i was you know i was driving home from the river i think saturday and i was like i'm gonna listen to a few episodes to prep for this and i and that was the first episode and like within 20 minutes, it's like this life and death story. And I'm just like, dude, what am I bringing to the table? I've, I don't fish that much on my own. I have two boys that are 10 and 12 now. And I, I basically either guide, you know, middle-aged to elderly men or 10 and 12 year old boys now is really like my fishing stories. Uh, <laughs> Those are sometimes the best stories. Yeah, totally. So we were, <laughs> so we, we've, we've, we striper fish a lot, you know, the, my local fishery right here is the lower Sacramento river. And we have a huge population of resident stripers and we were out in the boat this summer or this spring and we're fishing a, a big run. The, the lower Sac's a fairly large river, um, especially in the spring. And both my boys, it's kind of their first year throwing the big nine weights and shooting heads and lead, you know, big lead eye flies and 10 and 12. It's, you know, it's like you're down in the boat, like taking shrapnel as these two boys are winging these things over the top of the boat. And I'm more focused on uh, basically, you know, where their flies and lines are going in reference to my head than like what's going on fishing wise. But I'm getting on them about, you know, they're casting and they're stripping and we're fishing this bank and they're not catching anything, but I'm, you know, working with them. And my youngest looks at me and he's like, hey, dad, Something's going on downriver, and I'm like, no, 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 pay attention, stay focused. You know, <laughs> don't worry about what's around the next bend. We gotta fish this wall. They're here. I see them on the graph. Like we're gonna get them to eat. And so they make a few more casts, and I'm, you know, ducking and bobbing and weaving, running the motor. And my youngest is like, no, dad, there's something going on down there. And I'm, buddy, like, pay attention. And I start to get like kind of, you know, stern with him. I'm like, hey, man, stay focused. They're here. We're gonna get them. And he's like, okay. So he battens down and 
keep stripping and we don't get anything. And he's like, dad, I think you really need to look down river. And I'm like, fine. And so I, I get up off my console and I look down river and it is like something out of like, it's like a striper blitz. <laughs> it's like the water is just like exploding everywhere. There's fish just everywhere. It's like one of the biggest striper blitzes I'd ever seen on my home river after like 15 years. And my son looks at me like super dry, dead pan. He's just like, dad, I think they're all down there. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think they are. And so we go down there and it's like, we just start railing fish. And it was probably one of the, the best little striper sessions I'd had with my boys, but they caught, I don't know, 20, 30 fish one after the other. But if we would have skipped the 20 minutes of me fishing the dead water, <laughs> <laughs> I forced them to fish. We uh, you know, we may have caught more fish. Oh yeah, it just sounds like he's ready to be a guide, right? Always look oh. down river, right? Yeah, no, I wasn't even paying attention. I was so focused on like, dude, I found fish on the graph, like knuckle up. This is what fishing is, boys. Like we fish like hard. We're going to pound the water. We're going to get after this. And like they stuck to it, didn't break as like every time they look up, there's just blowing up fish everywhere like you know 500 yards down river they're like yeah no we're staying here with dad and then finally dad paid attention and took him to where the fish actually were so <laughs> you know i have to say i give you such major props that your boys are already learning how to fly fish because i met <laughs> my mom and dad first off weren't fly anglers but they never really yeah. took me out to go fly fishing and yeah. the other this past um summer jess and i took sawyer and he wanted mm -hmm. to learn how to fly fish and sawyer's six and it is yeah. dangerous i mean that thing is flailing i was oh no ducking. it's i was hiding yeah. in front of the bow of the bow underneath the seat and yeah and sawyer we, you know he's like whipping it so far and then finally he looks at me and he goes see mom this is how easy it is. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, that's all right, kid. <laughs> yeah, I, I give major props for, for parents that are teaching their kids to go fly fishing first because that is a dangerous sport. That should be actually a sport in the Olympics, parents teaching kids how to fly fish, which at that end, you have um, an organization called Cast Hope. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me a yeah. little bit about that. Yeah, so you know, um, we've been doing cast hope for about 10 years now, 10 or 11, again, I, it, for a while, probably about 10 years. And, um, it came as, uh, my, my partner in cast hope, Ryan Johnston, we were both working on our master's degrees here in Chico at Chico state. And he was getting an MBA and I was getting like a master's in history, which really served no purpose, but I was doing it to avoid student loan payments. So, <laughs> Um, his had way more application. He was getting an MBA. So, um, he, uh, we were sitting in, basically sitting in a taco bar in, in, um, Chico one night after we got off the river, it was in the winter, we'd been stealing, guiding steelhead all day. And he's like, Hey, I got this idea to start a nonprofit. And I'm like, you're getting in an MBA. Why the hell are you going to start a nonprofit? First of all, <laughs> you know, like, are you crazy? Uh, yeah, I'm like that. Why don't you just be a fly fishing guy? That's a way smarter <laughs> business move, you know? Um, but he's like, yeah, I want to, I, I want to start donating guide trips and take kids and, you know, like a mentor out on a free trip. And I'm like, wow, that's, that seems like a good idea. I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that. And it was kind of at that time, like I was probably in my, my late twenties and you know, when I started coming up in fly fishing, I was about six or 17 years old working and, you know, you were always the young kid in any room, right? Like at 16 or 17, it's you and all the, the all the adults. And as I continued, you know, to build a career or work in the fly fishing industry, I was in my late twenties and I was like, you know, I'm still the youngest guy in the room. And that's not really a model for a sustainable sport. And, you know, what, what, what I had seen kind of in my generation and in, I had seen, you know, I grew up outdoors and it was very obvious that a very sh short gap between my generation and the next generation didn't necessarily grow up outdoors. You know, a lot of kids that I was around at that time, you know, didn't have that opportunity. Um, they were romanced by, you know, video games and TVs and screens and the 
the life that I had, the life that I came up with, you know, growing up on 20 acres with a river as your backyard, I, I realized very early on that that was not the normal. And um, I kind of had a kind of one of those, I don't know, epiphanies at that age where it was like, you know, I uh, either be part of the problem or part of the solution. You know, you either get to complain about you know, kids staring at screens and not going outside and the sport not growing and, you know, kids not getting into the sport or you, you know, do something about it. And so me and Ryan, we, we started donating one trip a month to take a kid and a mentor out fishing, you know, just on a day off. And, um, we had no clue what we were doing. I mean, I, I would say 99.9% of what we did was probably hideously illegal. <laughs> I mean, we were, <laughs> we were uninsured. We, I mean, we didn't know what the hell we were doing, you know? Um, but you but, were doing good things. Yeah. You know, it, it was, and what it was is, you know, the model of, you know, we're going to take a kid and put him out on a, a piece of grass and teach him how to cast and then teach him all his knots. Like, there's no reason a kid likes there. I mean, there's no wonder a kid likes the video game better than that. You know what I mean? Like that model doesn't work, you know? And we were like, no, we're going to put a kid, we're going to throw a life jacket on him. We're going to put a fly rod in his hand, put him in the front of a drift boat and put him on a fish in like 20 minutes and like (laughs) hard sell. Right. Like, bam, let's go. And what we realized, it was like, that works. I mean, fishing's fun, no matter if you're 50 or you're 10 or you come from, you know, the inner city or, you know, the country, like a fish pulling on a fly rod. I mean, I don't care who you are. That's fun. And, um, we realized that we were kind of onto something, you know, and we, we pair these kids came to us from like, you know, the boys and girls club, like organizations that have been around forever. And it was something that they did with their mentor. And then a lot of times their mentor was stoked on it and they could then go do it again. It was replicatable. You know what I mean? It wasn't a one-time experience. And we started to realize like, you know, you don't, you don't change the world or build anglers by one-time experiences, you know, like that's not, that's not how this works. Like we started to commit. We said, it's like, okay, we're doing this every other week. These are our core kids, you know, instead of going, we're going to serve a hundred kids. We said, we're going to take five kids out on guided trips every two weeks. And we're going to really create anglers that will then, you know, idealistically be us in 20 years. You know what I mean? And then that spreads. Right. And so you know, man, I mean, when we, when we got serious about it, 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 it really started to grow. And now we, I mean, we, we run like a real nonprofit that operates, you know, we have (laughs) multiple territories throughout the state of California. Um, Conway Bowman runs our Southern California chapter. Um, Matt Heron runs our Western Nevada, um, region. Uh, we still run our Northern California region. Chuck Reagan runs our gold country, Sacramento, Central California region. Um, and before COVID, we were looking at expanding to a, a fourth region. So, you know, we service about, we service about 600 kids a year. Um, most of our kids fish with their mentor and a guide every two weeks. You know, um, we give out fly rods, fly reels. We give out probably about 200 fly rods and reels. Um, every year to our kids and their mentors so that those kids and then mentors can, um, you know, go and fish on their own. And this year, kind of one of the, the, we've, we've, we've had kind of cast hope come full circle this year is two of our original kids, um, graduated high school this year and, um, we bought them drift boats and one, went, and one went out to Palisades Lodge on the South Fork of the Snake River and guided all summer. And another one went out to Kelly Gallup's Lodge and guided all summer at Kelly Gallup's Lodge. So, um, you know, these wow. are, it's and these are kids that, you know, to tell you their stories in a public thing would not be the most kosher thing. But I mean, these are, um, you know, these are kids that didn't have a whole lot going for them. You know, that really this, you know, 
probably save their lives, you know? So, and we deal with kids, you know, we, if you, if we're writing a grant and telling you that we'd say, you know, we deal with, you know, underserved kids, but, um, we've never said no to a kid that's applied to our program, you know, and, um, you know, underserved comes, in many different ways, man. I mean, I, I've sat in a truck with a kid that I picked up at juvenile hall and a kid whose parents make millions of dollars from the peninsula. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he doesn't even see him. So, you know, wow. under, and those kids are going fishing together. You know what I mean? Um, that is so underserved. Incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, we deal with the full spectrum, you know, it, um, we we're fairly isolated in the fly fishing world. Um, it's really hard to get outdoors. It's really hard to access the outdoors if you don't have parents or even if you have parents, um, but you don't have the, so, the financial means to do it, you know, and that's kind of, we don't want there to be a reason that kids don't get outdoors. And it's just so happens we know fly fishing. So that's how we get them out. You know, and, and fly fishing is expensive and absolutely. It's also, I mean, honestly, if I didn't, if I had never met Justin, it would have, it would have been me dependent on me to want to go fly fishing. And so absolutely. I think it was because I was watching him and seeing what he was doing and, you know, having something to do outside that kept you outdoors, engaged in outdoors is what inspired me to want to go fly fishing. So yeah. I think to inspire that at a young age and harvest that and see them grow into almost as a, to grow that into a profession is even yeah. cooler. And what a rewarding you know, you don't do things for the reward. You just do it for people to have a better opportunity and to see somebody yeah. bring that as an opportunity for their, for their career is inspiring. I think that's so great. And, um, thank you. I can't, oh, I can't yeah, believe no. also that you just do this on your spare time. Cause <laughs> you know, life is busy and I think it takes yeah. great individuals to say, I'm going to put breaks on what needs to be done to what, what I'm going to do to give back to the community. Because if we love fly fishing, we want it to see it continue to strive to thrive. Uh, we yeah. need it. We need it to grow and, and we need to plant the seed for this younger generation. So that's incredible. I love that story, Hogan. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I just, a lot of things I've done in my life are fueled by that. You know, you don't get to complain unless you're not doing, so, unless you're doing something about it. You know, and I just, <laughs> I just refuse to, you know, sit around and complain and not take action or, you know, look at the world and see what's wrong and not do something about it. So, well, and it's, you hear that all the time, like kids are on their tablets, kids are on their tablets. So kudos to you for for (laughs) fixing the problem. But on also what I think is super interesting on top of the fact that you donate your time to help other kids learn how to fly yeah. fish is that you're the co-founder of California Bass Union. And I yeah. think it's so interesting to me because I think of California, I think of, I do not think of bass. I think a bass needs to be somewhere in Wisconsin, Minnesota, <laughs> you know, um, and maybe that's, that's the reason why that was created. I'm curious what yeah, sure. the bass union in California. So the California Bass Union is kind of the brainchild of me and one of my really dear friends, Chuck Reagan. Um, Over probably the last 15 years, I've really kind of shifted from being a trout guide to being a bass guide. And uh, that's a pretty hard thing to do in California, as you said. But, um, you know, rowing a drift boat, you know, 200 some, 100 some days a year. Uh, on your body definitely has an expiration date, you know, and, um, I watched one of my mentors, Mike Costello kind of make the move, um, from a trout guide to a striper guide for a lot of reasons. Um, a lot of the same reasons, but you know, it, it, it's a closer fishery to where I am in my striper fishery and my bass fishing. And the more I got into it and kind of was poking around doing it in my free time, the more I realized as I got into it with a couple of my buddies, John Sherman, Chuck Reagan is, you know, California is one of the best bass fishing states there is. Um, you know, you have the Delta, which is consistently ranked as if not the best in the top five bass fisheries in the state. You have Clear Lake, Lake Berryessa, all these lakes that are, you know, nationally ranked top 10 bass fisheries in the state. And 
I looked at it of like, you know, this guiding for bass out of a motorboat, it's, it's easier on your body. It's uh, closer to home, you know, puts me at soccer practice if I need to be at soccer practice, you know. Um, I come home with more in the gas tank, so to say, than if I'd rode a boat for eight hours a day. I'm just going to plop on the couch and, you know, kind of be, I'm not even present, you know. I mean, I'm yeah. sure you, you live with a fly fishing yes. guy that's, you know. <laughs> so um, about 15 years ago, I kind of started to get into it as a, as a, you know, this is a mandatory thing. And as I got into it, I mean, I live you know, 10 or 15 minutes from probably the greatest striped bass fishery west of the Mississippi. And, um, you know, it's pretty new. Like, it's definitely under the radar. Um, Chuck Reagan, my partner in it, lives close to a couple, well, two lakes where it seems every year the world record spotted bass is caught and broken, you know. Um, John Sherman, my other dear friend since college, lives on the Delta, which is you know, one of the greatest largemouth fisheries and all of us were kind of talking. It's like, no one does this. (laughs) Like, you know, (laughs) people drive six hours to go fish the McLeod or they, you know, they chase, you know, trout all over the place. But you know, how many, literally, if you drove in our state from the Bay area to the McLeod, you probably pass nearly a dozen of the best bass fisheries in the country. (laughs) <laughs> and wow. we're we're like what are we doing you know like what why are we not doing this more and and in reality those fisheries aren't getting anything but better you know salmon runs in our state trout fishery you know everything's in danger when you look at the salmonoid species you know yes. and you know you we really started it as a a, a a promotional tool, I guess, to spread bass fishing and tell people about, you know, look, and it, it kind of goes hand in hand with cast hope to some degree is it's like, you know, if you pull up a map of California and you look at where the trout are, and then you pull up a map of California and look at where the bass are, there's not a lot of places in California where there's not bass and you got to drive to get to trout, you know, yeah. so access, you know, people have access to bass in our state like they you know most people can be at a bass lake or pond or ditch and you know 20 30 minutes um and so it kind of all came to the head of like we have all these world-class fisheries we have all this access for people we're all guiding it or fishing it in our own we need to promote this and get people to do this and Chuck had become good friends with an, a good friend of ours, Mike Schultz, out in Ohio or uh, Michigan, and Mike started something out there called the uh, the Small Jaw Syndicate, kind of with the same thing of you know to promote smallmouth fishing in an area where not a lot of people thought about smallmouth fishing, and so the the Cal Bass Union is kind of that. It's a collection of about seven of us throughout the state, and it's really just all my buddies that would say yes to me when all I had was an idea. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) They're not like, they're not, it's not like we went out and got the, you know, the professional bass unit. It's, you know, me and Chuck or, you know, basically blood brothers, Ryan Williams, another one of our dear friends who fishes here is kind of the, the guy that invented and brought float and fly fishing to the bass world out of the conventional world to the fly world. Um, Mike Costello, my mentor, kind of the godfather of the Delta. Um, Matt Callies up in Reading, who's kind of this mad scientist type of guy that invents all sorts of crazy flies and does a bunch of bass fishing up on in Reading, where nobody fishes for bass, they all fish for trout. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Alex Cady down in San Diego, who, you know, is in an ocean, you know, lives on the ocean, but drives inland to fish for giant largemouths, you know, so it's kind of this pack of misfits that kind of (laughs) taken the the non-traditional avenues and fly fishing. And, you know, we're trying to kind of spread it and show people that, you know, there's a lot you can do with a fly rod besides, you know, trout fish. So. Well, and catching a bass on a fly rod is so exciting. I mean, we have this family cabin in Wisconsin and, you know, I brought my fly rod and, and they're fun. They are really fun. And, you know, for me, I guess, um, 
it's not that I don't like catching trout, but honestly, I just like catching fish and the ones that fight the most are a little bit more fun. And, um, bass or bass pike, they're, they're, they're great fish to catch. And, um, in Montana, Justin likes to whack them on the head and we like to eat them for t- fish taco. Night. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah no, <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, we, we eat plenty of stripers and spotted bass and you know, there is absolutely zero guilt, right? Like it's, right? you know, it's not you're like not you're going out about and... how you're handling it. Like, yeah. does, it, does it need to breathe again? Did I, did I do anything no. wrong? You're just like, yeah, yeah well, good luck. Cause they're pretty yeah. tough fish. So, oh yeah, yeah. no, no, okay. there's, there's no, you can, you can grip and grin those as many as you, times <laughs> as you want, man. Like, yeah, yeah. they are. No shame. <laughs> yeah, Definitely no shame. no shame at all. Well, yeah. Hogan, you're also a reputable fly tire. And yeah, I, I I'd love, like to think so. Yeah. Oh, well, you are. I mean, yeah. I think that Hogan Brown is probably the best fly, one of the best fly tires I know. Oh, <laughs> for wow, the record. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is. And so I guess how, for me, it's, it's such an art. It, it needs to flow. It needs to look good. Um, <laughs> and you got to really create this in your mind and yeah. it's a piece of art. So give me, give me a little piece of your brain. How do you come up with these patterns? <laughs> and <paint> them? <laughs> so it's way less glamorous than it sounds. I started tying flies. I grew up guiding on the lower Yuba river. And when I grew up, it was like, 18 year old kid and then like a bunch of old crusty chain smoking dudes rowing aluminum boats <laughs> and when i started guiding out totally like i love them to death i'm not, that <laughs> is not a derogatory like, <laughs> i was gonna say i don't think yeah. that's anybody everyone's like yes yeah. i love those yeah people. Let, let me be straight up like that i mean i'm i'm okay if i end up like that you know i'm i'm, <laughs> I'm trying to remain a little healthier but you know if if will be will be And I always was working for older guides, like guys that I really looked up to. And so like kind of the code, like I never rode out in front of those guys. You know what I mean? Like I was never going to be the first guy down the river. Um, I didn't, you know, I was young. I wanted to keep working and get ass back. So, you know, I hung back, I fished behind everybody. And very early on, I was like, well, that's not going to work if I'm fishing the same fly as everyone else is. So basically I started coming up with my own flies because I was like, man, this is the only way I'm going to survive is if I am throwing something at that fish besides, you know, the 38th print nymphs they've seen that day from guys that are way better guys that went in front of me. So I was an only child growing up on 20 acres and, um, I, I was on the river and I was like, man, if I got, I got a, you know, this is before, you know, DVDs and the internet and all this stuff. I'm like, well, if I want to tie flies, like I got to learn what they look like. So I would snorkel the river during the big hatches. And I wow. would, um, I would, I had like a, a, a weight belt I made with these old, like five and 10 pound weights, um, from my weight bench, which wasn't getting much use because I wasn't much of an athlete by that point. So, uh, I was sinking myself with my (laughs) weights versus pumping iron. Um, and I would just watch, you know, and I like, I would just watch the bugs and I, I just became obsessed with seeing something and then creating it. And then fooling something with my creation you know it was i had no idea you can make money off flies or you know get well known or any of that and i I still think that's kind of silly because you know i was fortunate enough like i couldn't tell you i ever had an original idea i was just looking at something and putting thread on a hook that i thought looked like it and you know i was fortunate to spend time around bob quigley kind of at a, a formative time and You know, so I I got to spend some time around great tires, Bob Quigley, um, Mike Mercer, um, Andy Burke, some of these guys, you know, talked to me when I was a young kid and really helped me out and kind of opened my eyes to some simple things. But it, 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 it's the simple things that, you know, we never think of. And I think tie and flies really came out of that necessity or that, that insecurity that, uh, I had to be. I had to do something to keep putting people in my boat because I was the young guy or the new guy. And that insecurity has always 
you know, or that kind of, you can always do better. You can always improve, you know, kind of always leads me back to the fly bench to tweak or change or look at the bugs. I still snorkel, um, all the time. Uh, one of my really good buddies is a, a spear fisherman and, uh, he dives the, some of the big rivers around here and I make him film bait fish schools and, wow. you know, I, I study videos of bait fish at, you know, I say, no, I need this at a various, you know, time of the day so I can see what the light looks like. How do they move? You know what? Throw a rock in that pool, film it. I'm going to, you know, you, now, you are just, they constantly changing. Like, have you noticed that fish have start to evolve to different strategies of moving? Yeah. Around? You know, it's just when I, when I, I've become really, as I've become a just complete obsessed striper fisherman, I, I spend massive amounts of time watching predator prey interaction and like what is the things about the prey that key the predator you know what is yeah. the silhouette or the water movement you know stripers hit hunt with lateral lines so i uh i've really got obsessed over the last year or two with like pressure sensors and trying to determine like how much water displacement certain bait fish push water because that's going to be the first way a, a striper experiences that fly is that pressure displacement and you know super nerdy stuff i mean it definitely is no, not I like i love that <laughs> it's, no, I if think i it's... was if it if i was single it's definitely not like bar pickup talk <laughs> so unless she's like unless she's a heavy lift weight lifter totally. like hey, can, I borrow, can i borrow some of your <laughs> totally. weights <laughs> totally I, totally i go look at the bottom of the water <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no so i mean i i guess the fly tying thing just comes from this like you know that that's that's what the fish is going to eat and, you know, um, never settling for good enough or, you know, cause everybody knows no matter how hot the fly is or how hot the bite is, mm -hmm. something's going to change. You know what I mean? It's your only King for the moment, you know, like yes, that's going to shut off or that fly is going to get played out or whatever it is. You got to keep up and you got to keep pushing and, um, I, I think I that's probably what keeps leading me back to like the vice and trying to create. So oh, kind of a I long answer it. to a simple question. No, it really wasn't a simple <laughs> question. It was a, it was a, it was a loaded question. I was asking okay. why do you, why do you keep going to that vice? And I'm sure it's, yeah. um, it brings a lot of questions to, and, and also I think what's interesting is that, you know, I think when you leave the river or the lake or wherever you're fishing and things aren't going well, you're always kind of basing it based on your bug like what yeah what bug am i using you're never i don't know so i think it's really important the bug is probably the most important part of actually the fly rod yeah and i mean i tell people all the time you know it's it kind of comes down to the fact of two is it's the, it's the only thing uh, when you're guiding like i think I'm, i've been a guide now for I don't know, over 20 years and so much of success or whatever it is catching fish or you know whatever is it's it's completely out of our control you know what i mean like what the weather is going to be like that day if the fish are going to eat if the you know whatever and i i think i always feel that like my fly and what i tie and what i create i have a hundred percent control of that like that is the part of the equation that i can control and so yes. that's better well be flawless <laughs> you know like <laughs> i gotta nail that because that's the i gotta you know i can control this so it's gotta be there's no margin for error with it i think that's the that's such a good mindset for an angler blame it on your flies <laughs> <laughs> totally, can totally. Do it. <laughs> that's i do that a lot <laughs> well it's better than i blame it on justin i'm like justin <laughs> you did go. something wrong with this fly okay <laughs> so totally. this is not because yep. of me it all has to do with you so totally. Hogan, on top of all of your amazing adventures, you also have a podcast. So we have that. Yeah. We have that in common yeah. as well. And so, um, tell me, what is what is your podcast? <laughs> tell me a little so, bit more about your podcast. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I, I'm really good friends with uh, the guys that run the Barbless Podcast Network, and um, they have a couple podcasts. They uh, Conway Bowman does one. Him, him and his wife, Michelle, do one for them. Um, Matt Heron does one for them out in Truckee and Reno. Um, another gentleman does one up in the Pacific Northwest. And then Nick and Chad, who 
co-founders of Barbless do the kind of original one here in Chico. And it's, they're very educational podcasts like Nick and Chad have on like, you know, biologists and scientists and like delve into some pretty like deep stuff, you know? And, um, they asked me, they're like, Hey, do you want to start doing some podcasts? And I was like, I'll be real. Like, yeah, I'll do some podcasts, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to be like 10% educational and like 90% <laughs> like me just BSing with like my buddies throughout the fly fishing world. And, uh, they're like, perfect. I'm like, so I, so I can have anyone on my show that I, they're like, yes, absolutely. So like all these other guys in the podcast network, like take these really like, you know, they're talking about interesting, like very deep topics and like, I bring on my friends and we talk about like <laughs> patio boats and like college football and fly fishing and, you know, random stuff that is just pure entertainment. So, um, you know, our next guest, we have a guest coming up. I, I'm a, I've collected a collection of fly fishing wives and oh, you know, wives that are married to fly fishing guides. And I'm going to be like, all right, dude. Let's hear it. <laughs> What's oh, it like man. being married to a fly fishing be guy? Be prepared. because <laughs> Totally. I bet no, you could no. get an earful of that yeah. one. Are these totally. wives, do they have kids too? Because if they have some kids too, that'll be There's enough. a few. There's a few kids in there. And I, I wanted to get both, right? Because like, yeah. it's kind of cool, I think, if you don't have kids. Because you get to yeah. fish a lot and like travel all over and do oh. this cool stuff. And then... You have oh, kids. Yeah. And- I, I think I was like, Justin, I'm going to help you make some lunch. I'm going to be doing yeah. this. And, yeah. you know, I think at the tail end of it, you're both just exhausted at the end of the day, especially when you have young ones. But that, that could be a, a rant on my own. For another- <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> another podcast. But totally. yeah, no, I think it's so great. And I think the best thing about fly fishing is that there isn't really anyone who you talk that whether they're the most experienced fly anglers um, or the beginning is that you kind of go into both the welcoming of the water with just like true passion of just wanting to, to be there. So I think having that casual conversation is so important because I think if oh, you're yeah. talking about how hardcore fishing is, I mean, it can turn a lot of people off on wanting to go fishing (laughs) because how do I become part of this community if I don't feel like I'm part of that conversation yeah and it's you know that's one thing I think I've as I've gotten older and I've had kids and I've and I've worked with cast hope and I've done all this stuff is it's um I mean first of all I'm just incredibly lucky to be able to get to do what I do but at the same time it's like you can't take any of this too seriously Mm -mm. (laughs) you know I mean we're just (laughs) we're going fishing and it's not even really a smart way to go fishing. So, (laughs) you know, the success rate, if you're actually trying to catch fish is probably not the smartest choice of equipment to do it with. um, It's so true. You know, and it's, I always relate it to like, you know, the beautiful thing about fishing is kind of like, I, I, you know, when you think back on like high school sports or, you know, sports when you're a kid and like, I was talking to my boy who's both my boys play hockey and we were talking about hockey and stuff. And I'm like, man, I, I don't even really remember any games, but I could tell you about a lot of bus rides, a lot yes. of locker rooms, a lot of just shenanigans. And 100%. You know, that's kind of like what I, you know, it's like, that's fishing. Like, I don't really remember many of the fish, but I could tell you all sorts of nights out after we fish and trips mm-hmm. to go, f- you know, and, and that's kind of, that's the culture of fly fishing, right? It's the, it's all the stuff between the hooking of the fish that make for the good stories and such and the, the bonding between people and such. So that's kind of what I try to bring into it. Yep. A hundred percent. You said that so well. I, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say, Hogan. Yeah. <laughs> but, Like-minded. Um, <laughs> totally. Well, if people are wanting to reach out to you, learn more about all the work sure. you're doing, yeah. uh, I guess, cause you have so much going on. <laughs> is there, uh, is there, a, what's the best way for them to reach you and contact you and learn sure, more about Sure. Just, your- just my website. I, it's all there. HGB fly fishing dot com and you can steer off to the Calabas Union or Cast Hope or any, you know, random post on smoking meat or barbecuing animals or, you know, <laughs> anything that I talk about there. So 
Yeah. Yeah. It's and all then there. you also and you're also it's on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, with- HGB Fly Fishing on Instagram and Facebook too. Yeah. You can check all that stuff out for random assortments of kid pictures, food and fish. So but don't expect him to be on there all the time because no to tablets. Yes to going <laughs> yeah, on no, I, 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 I'm <laughs> I, I have to, man. I have to like set limits Ugh. for myself because, you know, running a business in this day and age, it's like, yeah, I got to be on the computer and you got to be on social media. And it's, you know, know, me and my wife both run our own businesses. And it's like, we really, we have to keep each other in check to be present when we're with our kids and when we're with each other. You know, it's that's our big thing is like, be present, you know. Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns, and if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at thefebruaryroom.com. The February Room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.